Isaiah chapter 61. We've been looking at some studies and I've entitled the series, The Eternal Exchange. And it really was brought to light while we were still working through and we, I still plan to return to the parallel series or the original series in, in, in Luke, working through the Gospel of Luke. And, and that series was the certainty of the things that you have been taught. And these set of messages have really come out of, uh, of, of Luke chapter 4, where Jesus finds himself in the temple. He receives the scroll and he finds for himself that place where it's written. And he declares of himself, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. But why don't we read a passage here in Isaiah 61, reading at verse 1, and finishing at verse 3. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. In this chapter, I have seen that, that there is really as an overview, there are three main uh, areas uh, that ascribe to the Messiah. This is a mess messianic uh, passage and the outline of the chapter can be looked in these three ways verses 1 to 3 that the Messiah's mandate or his authority uh, by divine right it's been given to him not that he has usurped any other but no the father has purposed that the son would be honored and glorified in this way this, this the second aspect is the Messiah's inheritance verses 4 to 9 where righteousness dwells. Always has to do with that which is living, not merely a kingdom or a structure, but living souls, that which is conformed to hold the breath of life. And finally, the third aspect or heading in, in, this, in this chapter is the Messiah's joy found in Verses 10 and 11, he wears himself the garments of salvation. So that's a, an overview of the chapter and maybe we might work through some more of that over the coming weeks, but this morning we are looking specifically at the phrase in verse three. That they may be called trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified have you considered how often trees are a part of the scriptures and how often they are mentioned and brought to light trees in the first and last books of the Bible there stands trees of distinction Genesis records the creation of God and in Genesis 1 verse 12 we can read and the earth brought forth grass and herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit which seed is in itself according to its kind and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1 verse 29 and God said see I have given you every herb that yields seed which is in the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food also to every beast of the earth to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life I have given every green herb for food and it was so 
Following the creation of the living things, we see two specific trees mentioned. What are they? Where do we find those? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. That's right, Barry, and it was said over here. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of all the living things, trees are mentioned second only to men and women in the scriptures. That's an interesting observation, isn't it? If you have a a search, a word study on, on trees, you'll find it's mentioned over and over again. Different types of trees, various trees. The book of Revelation holds a tree. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. bears its fruit in its season and its leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations the scripture recounts I certainly haven't got time to try and unpack any of the detail there but it it is going to be food for thought and 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 helpful in what we're looking at this morning Revelation 22 verse 1 and he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the lamb in the midst of its street And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and forever. Here's a time yet to happen. The events, the culmination of time. When the glory of God is revealed millennium reign of Christ New Jerusalem descending out of heaven read the passages encourage your heart don't be trapped by this world and what it's trying to dictate to us find our hope and strength in him remind us remind ourselves of the purposes that God have determined for us just as a Aside mention, just considering the Lord and his splendor. It was mentioned to me yesterday, Brother Steve rang and got in contact with me. Um, Sister Lindell's dad took ill very suddenly yesterday, uh, or over the last couple of days actually, but but very quickly. And and last night he did pass. There is there is the obviously the, 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 the feeling of loss and the sadness there. I don't know where his heart lay out laid, whether his name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I can't answer that question. I don't know that side of the family that well, but Sister Margaret Marg and Lyndall, obviously this morning not with us, Steve, they are in Toowoomba with family, so we can remember them. But in the midst of all of that, this is a time that's spoken of in the Scriptures where there'll be no tears. Sadness is done away with. For we will hold him, the glory of who he is. The toils of this life will eventually make sense. The dark threads, the black threads that have been for us, for many, trying and difficult, woven together with the threads of gold, threads of joy, threads of fellowship and participation. All of this is purposeful as the Lord tries us, proves us, and reveals himself to us. Never lose the sight of what will be. The certainty 
of our hope is sure. We celebrate it this morning. Do this as often as you're together until when he comes or calls. We rejoice together in the celebration of the Lord's table, fellowshipping with him, remembering all things. It's interesting that the, 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 the end books, the beginning and the end, have trees in the very first and the very last chapters. But what of this other tree found between its pages, the root and offspring of David, placed upon another tree, Calvary's tree? We remember the sacrifice Christ gave of himself, the root of David. He's not only the root, he is the branch, he is the leaf, he is the fruit. He is the entire vine, if you will. He said of himself, I am the true vine. It's interesting to consider all the references through scripture, how important trees have been to establish. There's many types of trees. The fig tree, though the fig tree does not blossom, there be no herd in the stall. The produce of the Isle of Fails, and the fields yield no food. Yet, what does Habakkuk say? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. The pomegranate, the tamarisk, the cedars of Lebanon. How often through the Psalms you hear of the cedars of Lebanon and the reaccounting of where they uh, source the timber from for the building of, of, of um, the temple in Jerusalem. Even hyssop, which I didn't realize was also noted as a tree. First Kings um, 4 renders this of Solomon. Thus, uh, First Kings 4 verse 30 to 32. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled and wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, than Ezra Height, and Hermon, and Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. He also spoke of trees from the cedar of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that sprang out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish, and men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who, heard, who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Then you consider the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. God's instruction to build the tabernacle was very specific. Out of all the trees that could have been used, the acacia, or in the, new, in the King James, it's called shittim wood, but it, it refers to the acacia wood. I didn't realize the, the significance of, 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 the, of the intrinsic values that acacia wood has, particularly in cabinet, cabinetry and, and furniture making. I thought that it was a, a, a twisted wood and, and gnarly and, and hard, but it's actually quite um, variations, obviously, in, in, the, uh, in the types that are available, but the wood is very straight. It has a great density. It is a hard wood. It is water resistant. Uh, it was used uh, very often uh, by Her Majesty in the Royal Navy to build the sailing ships of years gone by, where Britain, Britain ascended to such uh, uh, control of the waves um, using such timbers as acacia for the hull, the internal structures, because of its uh, uh, 
the, the, ten the, the tenacity of the wood, but its strength, its tensile strength. Incredible, brilliant, beautiful. But it can be so fashioned and worked with. Exodus 25 recounts the selection and use. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and, and a cubit and a half its width and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. Not only did the Lord provide instruction, he also selected men for the task of crafting all aspects of the tabernacle. And we read in Exodus 31, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Exodus 31 verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezaleel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting, of, cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, indeed, I have appointed him with, with him, a Aholiab, that's it. Thanks, honey. A Aholiab. I have appointed a Aholiab, the son of Wilbarrow, of the tribe of Dan. And I have put wisdom in the hearts of all gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tabernacle of meeting the ark of testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it. It's interesting to note when the scriptures set out the order in which the description and the instructions to make the articles for the, for the tabernacle were given. The first reference is to the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat. In typology, what does the ark and the mercy seat represent? In its description, it's really the work and the person of Jesus. The ark which contained the law, the rod of Aaron that budded, the bowl of showbread. Overlaid was the covering that came down with the two angels that covered the central place, a place that was then just above the actual mercy seat where the Shekinah glory of God manifested itself and the glory of God was seen. Moses received all of this instruction while on the mount. He received the law the tablets of stone written first penned by the finger of God. What were the children of Israel doing at the time while Moses was, had ascended the hill, the mount of God? They rose up to play, didn't they? They threw in their jewelry into a pot and poof, out came a calf. Well, that's the way that Aaron reported it to Moses. Oh, it was miraculous. All of these things, but it's so important to remember that God starts with the best first. He starts with his son. He gave his son. Then all the other aspects of the tabernacle and all the instruments that were there were laid out afterwards. But the first, he started with the one that would bring fellowship, Christ the one that would restore what was broken, Christ. The mercy seat, the offering that would be sprinkled over the covering. The glory of God manifested to receive, to receive um, 
the, the, the pardoning yet again for another year. We've just gone through this period of, of weeks where last Sunday, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles is this weekend in the Jewish calendar. I don't hold to the feasts, but it's good to remember what these feasts signified because they are found in our scriptures and they point us to a completed work of Calvary and a risen saviour who is now at the right hand of the Father on high, of majesty on high. And all authority is in his domain and reach and providence. Nothing escapes him. The ark speaks to us of his love. Perfect sacrifice. What other trees were there in scripture? Well, we find Elijah running from Jezebel. He hides himself under, in the, in the King James Version, a juniper tree or a broom tree. So determined because it was good for binding together to make a broom. Spindly. Hard, long wearing. He found himself there in fear of Jezebel, and the Lord spoke to him and there fed him as well. What other trees do you can recount? The olive tree, the palm tree, the fronds that were placed on the road as Jesus rode on a donkey's colt and entered into Jerusalem for that time of sacrifice. One minute they were declaring him king, be our sovereign. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But at the next moment, crucify him. Crucify him. How fickle our hearts are. How wayward we can be. Song of Songs talks of the apple orchard and the apple grove. So many references to trees throughout all the scripture. Micah chapter 6, and there is the, the acacia grove, the, the planted forest in, in Micah 6. There's an interesting reference found in Deuteronomy, talking of the cross again this morning, which I so very often find myself thinking about. Deuteronomy chapter 16, please turn with me, if you will, because this is important. Deuteronomy 16, verse 21. Reading from the New King James Version. You shall not plant for yourself any tree as a wooden image near the altar which you build for yourself to the Lord your God. You shall not set up a sacred pillar which the Lord your God hates. There's no beautification of the altar. There's no bringing something alongside the stark horror of the cross. The cross stands resolute and it's not to be beautified because it is the same place every sinner must come. Here the beautification of the altar, that which symbolizes the cross of Calvary cannot be beautified for it is the place of death, the equalizer of every human heart, the proud and the lowly. Only by the way of the cross can the sinner come. Only by recognizing that we too died on Calvary's tree to confess our sins. That is also to repent of our sins. Repentance has been so misused. Repentance is not to be sorry. It may include the aspect of sorrow and brokenness, but it is to change and to turn from our sin, not merely to say to be sorry. Action is required of the heart and of the will to repent of our sin and no longer follow in the ways of sin, but by being born again by the Spirit of God, 
Yes, as the scripture renders it, being born of the spirit of water and of the blood, found in 1 John 5, 6 to 12, the spirit and the water and the blood, they agree as one when we've come to Christ and given over everything. But there's no beautifying it. You can't get away from its stark reality. It is the place where sin must be left, nailed to the cross, given over, surrendered. And the instruction of the Lord here in Deuteronomy was that they wanted to make this place of the flow of blood, the sacrificing for animals, for sin, for atonement. They needed to change its presentation, make it more palatable. So often we are seeing in Christendom at large the replacement of the cross for something other than what God has intended. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Yes, Jesus has done this once for all, but until in the human heart they recognize the need of individual recognition of your own personal sin and come to that same place, Calvary, we will remain dead in our sins and look for a means to hide the altar, to place a grove, to beautify it, to hide its shame. But for us who are in Christ, the altar has such wonder and yet a beauty that is eternal for we recognized it was Christ who died in my place. He died for me. Now I live for him. And what to our text this morning specifically? Back in Isaiah chapter 61. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he may be glorified. It could be translated oak of righteousness. If you will, practiced in discerning right and wrong. This is the specific type of tree that we are to be in Christ. Righteous in him. Herein we refocus again on the elements that we have already covered in this eternal exchange. He's given us beauty for our ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise, the spirit of heaviness. All for what purpose? That we may be called trees of righteousness. Not something of ourselves. Not a works-based religion. But a glorious revelation of Christ in us. Righteousness from the Lord is without limits. Self-righteousness destroys the reputation of Christ in us. Only his righteousness bestowed upon us supersedes and lays bare all self-styled righteousness. It's not a work of ourselves, though we are practiced in discerning what is right and wrong because there has been this exchange. A new nature has been given. and We work through the process of putting off the old and putting on Christ. Ephesians speaks to this. We won't get to that this week. Maybe, maybe next time we come together, we will investigate 
Ephesians chapter 4. So maybe have a read through Ephesians chapter 4 and, and, and see for yourself what should be the, the marks of the Christian life in the context of putting off the old and putting on the new man in Christ. Amen. Why is righteousness so important? Why? 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 Jay, you've got it. Why? You're asking? If Christ is righteous and we are not, then who receives the glory from the substance of our life? Man. Flesh. If man is righteous, then who receives the glory? God does. As we only reflect the nature and the attributes of what of that which is bestowed upon us, garments, if you will, of righteousness. As the moon reflects the glory of the sun, so does the blood-washed sinner who reflects the glory of of the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. If we try and work our self-righteousness, we only destroy the life of Christ. It has to be Him in us. Being made manifest, being revealed is the right way to express it. Opened up. measuring ourselves by Christ. We see all the world, all creation, and all of mankind are without excuse because the righteousness of God has been revealed, yet man has preferred darkness rather than light. The highest systematic doctrinal work of the Apostle Paul is contained within the epistle to the Romans and is written to the believers who were living in Rome. He delineates and elucidates upon God's righteousness and its revealing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses questioning and answering to bring out the truth of God, to make plain that none are righteous save one. Turn with me as we just have a, a brief look at a few passages in the book of Romans. Reading at first, chapter 1 and verse 15 to start with. And I love the way how Paul terms this. So, as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. So, as much as in me, Paul nearing the completion of his race. He had fought the good fight and he's now bringing as much as in me in a feeble sense, yet he has brought such splendor and wisdom and counsel, bringing to life that which Jesus taught and lived and demonstrated, setting down an orderly pattern for us to live and to understand the requirements of God. But it goes on in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul then begins to launch into this treaty this, this, this argument for the cause of Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. 
for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. God has revealed his righteousness to us. And we receive this on the basis of our faith in what he has spoken. The testimony of those who have gone before, the prophets, the apostles, but more specifically in his son. On the Mount of Transfiguration, what were the words that the Lord God declared to bring Peter to silence? This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Listen to him. In that very uh, expression is the revealing of, of, of God the Father saying, I'm not like you. I'm not like anything that I've created, but I am like this one. He is my son. Listen to him. You'll find life. You'll find rest. You'll find hope. You'll find the issues of life contained in the reality of who he is. Not dead on a tree on Mount Calvary, but alive and risen in our hearts. This is where the glory of God is made manifest because he's changed many of you. He's changing me. Some of you need to change more. Some of me, all of me, needs to change a lot more. We know our walk, don't we? We know our failings. But Christ in us, the hope of glory The truth of his life made manifest, revealed, broken open so it can be seen. The reality of his righteousness, this tree that he plants in our life, the seed of who he is that would grow and bring forth and blossom into the reality of the Christ's fullness. His truth, his life, his character, his nature, his fullness in us. It's been revealed Paul goes on to then recount the wrath of God is being revealed. The righteousness of God has been revealed, but the wrath of God has been revealed also. But man hate the truth, and they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We can read the account through, and we haven't got time to go through it step by step. It is a colossal job to try and unpack all that the Spirit of grace worked in to this passage. It's immense. Move over to chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And reading at verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written... There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is the state of the world and of every human heart. Void. Of goodness. Yet in a moment, we can exchange that when the law comes. And we read in verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We cannot live in ignorance when there is the witness, both the internal witness of our conscience, God-given, 
but then through the preaching and declaration of the word of God and the life of Christ, we see ourselves destitute of hope apart from Christ, who is God's righteousness revealed. That's now accounted for in these next verses. Read with me in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This morning, are we named a tree of righteousness for the righteousness of Christ is so evident in our hearts? The next time we come together, I want to unpack this more of what it is to be righteous and what it is to be practiced in discerning between right and wrong and those things that are nearly right. But it must start with being named righteous. And it's not a work that we can earn because the price has already been paid. Jesus set forth as the sacrifice, the propitiation for us all. And he has become and is the righteousness of God revealed, the glory of God, the majesty, his goodness being revealed. was Moses' request. Adonai, show me your glory. What was God's response? I will let all my goodness pass by. God is good. It can't be hidden. It will be made manifest. It will be revealed in the life of you and me as we have given ourselves over so that light isn't just a flickering flame it's not a smoldering flax I'm not sure if you saw that there was a fire obviously out and the smoke had been whifting around and it it came even into the, the building and it just reminded me this morning he will not extinguish the smoking flax There might be embers in your heart that seem to be so cold and dull, yet the righteousness of Christ avails because he is righteous. He is just and true. And he will not allow us to be quenched if there is but a little heat, a desire, Lord, come and fill my heart. Come and flood the core of my being. I need your righteousness. Let me be named a tree of righteousness that you have planted. And this is a critical aspect which we will get to, the planting of the Lord, his work in us, the bringing to life of his his word, the bringing to life of his nature. 